Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Reuters events webinar on virtual trials versus trial virtualization. Uh, we've got a great panel lined up today, uh, so don't go anywhere. Uh, we're just going to hang on a minute or so, uh, just as I wait for the room to fill. Uh, I can see 100 people are already in here, but um, we've had well over 1,000 signups today. Um, so just going to wait for everyone to make their way in. Uh, just a reminder uh, before we get going, uh, we are going to be looking for your questions today. Um, so if you do use the Q&A function, that would be much uh, appreciated. Uh, we've got some time at the end of the discussion to get your questions and we'll hopefully as well um, actually be able to incorporate a few um, into the kind of uh, discussion as it goes on. Uh, that function is just found kind of at the bottom of your screen. You'll see the little Q&A box. Uh, so make sure to be asking those throughout the entire time. Uh, other than that, sit back, relax. Um, I'm going to hand over uh, now to our moderator, uh, who is Craig Lipset, advisor and founder at Clinical Innovation Partners, and will be handling things from here. Uh, good luck, everybody. Thanks so much, James. And thank you to the hundreds of people that have joined us here so far. It is remarkable to see how well, we're able to stay connected uh, despite everything in the world today. So thank you so much for choosing to share some time. Just by way of introduction, since you'll be uh, hearing my voice uh, for the next few minutes, as James mentioned, uh, I'm, uh, my name is Craig Lipset. I'm an advisor, an educator, a board member, an advocate. I advise with um, organizations, including in this, decentralized virtual trial space, working together with pharma companies on their implementations. I advise the IMI for their Trials at Home initiative and the IEEE on remote trials. I teach on this topic at Rutgers University and am a board member for organizations such as the Decentralized Trials Research Alliance, uh, MedStar Health, Circuit Clinical, and the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. So there's a little bit about me. Um, and let's just share a quick housekeeping note. Um, we will make sure that you all get a link to uh, a recording of the conversation you're about to hear, uh, but we're hoping you're going to be a participant in this recording. That last share on the stage is for you. And so please make good use of the Q&A box that you have there on the screen. We'll be watching for your questions throughout the conversation but we'll also leave time at the end to make sure if there are others we're able to get to, we will build that into our uh, session today. Clearly, the world today is different. There's no going back, and we all see the hashtag around that, but where are we going forward to? Some of the biggest shifts that we've all seen in 2020, certainly around ensuring continuity for our clinical trials, has been around shifting location whether that's the location for the study participant, whether it's the location for members of the study team, such as our monitors in the field, or location for site staff. These were the countermeasures, along with so many others that were critical for the collective research community to keep research going through 2020. And the community rose up to that challenge. When we look at the, uh, the ability to keep medicine pipelines moving, to resume enrollment, and to keep new clinical trial starts getting back online by the end of the calendar year. Now, what we see today is how these incremental countermeasures that we introduced midway through last year are starting to turn into organizational commitments, certainly for many research sponsors, research sites, and most of the other stakeholders in this ecosystem. Some of that commitment has accelerated new collaborations like the Decentralized Trials Research Alliance, DTRA. Organizations like DTRA that are positioned to help all of us move forward in this space. DTRA is a nonprofit membership organization and I am very pleased to mention that all three of our panelists today are members of the Leadership Council for DTRA. But while collaborations can raise all boats and make for a better environment in which we can operate, there's still a lot of work that's needed for all of us and our organizations to make commitments to these new approaches going forward. 
Today, we're going to be talking about virtual trials and trial virtualization. When we think about virtual trials, remote trials, direct to patient trials, decentralized trials, there is a lot of different jargon. But in all of these cases, we're leaning into creating options for where patients can participate in a trial. In some cases, maybe we'll be talking about a fully remote or fully decentralized trial. In other cases, elements of the study that can be de decentralized. But alongside that shift in where the participant can engage, 2020 has also virtualized other elements of trials. And so for today's conversation, we'll be talking about the virtual trials themselves and what's good look like, uh, we'll talk about diversity and other elements around participant experience, but then we'll build on that with a conversation around trial virtualization and what else can be shifted for location. And so to bring that conversation to life, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, our three panelists this morning. First, welcome Anthony Costello, president of Patient Cloud at Medidata. We also have Dr. Irfan Khan, the CEO of Circuit Clinical. And finally, Roz Round, Vice President of the Patient Innovation Center and Decentralized Trials at Parkcell. Welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us here. Great to be here. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. And now I know everyone's microphone is off mute and ready to go. <laughs> Well, let's jump right in. Um, we're talking first about virtual trials, and then we want to build this conversation around trial virtualization. Anthony, maybe you can get us started. As we're thinking about remote and decentralized trials, are these as good for patients as conventional trials? From a patient perspective, how do we measure or understand what does good look like when we're thinking about decentralized? Hey, thanks, Craig. Um, uh, it's, it's a big question, um, and uh, thanks for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk about this with all of you. Um, you know, I think what we've been trying to focus on for the last several years is reducing patient burden. And in, in some ways, the decentralization components of these trials can, can help do that, uh, but, but it's not the only thing that we can focus on. There's you know, you can, you can have a perfectly decentralized trial that might enable patients to, I think, as you put it in your opening remarks, to have options about where. But if you still have a lousy study design or a particularly burdensome uh, set of data that need to be collected or, or complicated logistics or, or even complicated technology, you know, I think one of the one of the misnomers here is that technology and decentralization will fix all things in clinical research, which, you know, clearly is not the case. So, uh, you know, what we want to do, if you just sort of pull the lens back a little bit, is we want to focus on reduction of patient burden, doing studies faster, giving them options, giving the site staff options, giving sponsors options, and, you know, generally finding ways that we can get to the complicated scientific answers that we're looking for in, in a way that's less burdensome and, and, and hopefully um, e even, even more, um, you know, integrated with the patient's real lives than clinical research has tended to be in the past. So, Anthony, I think in some ways you've just... Um done a little bit of myth busting because I'll see on Twitter or in some articles, people may post that a decentralized trial or a digital trial is patient centered. It is patient friendly. And that's not necessarily a given, is it? It's definitely not a given, but again, you know, I think I would just come back to what's the study design and what, just take a simple example. You know, if you have a huge majority of patients eligible for a study, vis-a-vis -vis inclusion exclusion criteria, but not geographically close to any site, de decentralization could be the whole ball game for them, right? It's the difference between participating in the trial or not participating in the trial. Um, but there's lots of other types of scenarios where just because the study is decentralized, just because there might be fewer visits to a center doesn't mean that there's not a lot of burden for that patient. And in fact, we could swing too far the other direction and load a patient with 14 different types of cell phones and apps they carry around and usernames and logins and so on, and create even more burden 
for that patient to participate in a study than they may have had uh, by just making frequent study visits. So, you know, I think that there's nothing magic about decentralizing the actual visit itself if that doesn't go hand in glove with a broader effort to make the, the protocol work and make the rest of the logistics around that study, uh, you know, work and, and considerate of the patients that have to participate. So Roz, let's build on that observation from Anthony and, and let's let's talk a little bit further about how to make sure when we're using digital and decentralized approaches, we're actually doing this in a way that does achieve our study objectives, our scientific goals, while also meeting the needs and expectations of the people who are participating. Roz, in your work, how do you keep those aligned? What are some best practices when we're planning for these types of studies to make sure that we're, we're not diverging in using technology in a way that is disruptive in a negative way to patients? Great question. Thanks, Greg. Um, so I think it's all about working with patients and also site staff at the very beginning in that planning stage to understand what works for them. So, for example, do those patients have an affinity with technology? Um, is it elderly patients? Maybe they've got age related macular degeneration, something like that. Perhaps adding in technology, as, um, as Anthony said, isn't going to improve their trial experience. Um, do they even have access to the technology? Do they have Wi-Fi? Do they have a cell phone? Do they have a good data plan that will enable them to be able to take part in um, telehealth visits, for example? Um, thinking about home nursing as well, how comfortable are people having someone in their home? Do, would they prefer to see someone nearby in a hotel? Um, is having someone, particularly during COVID, is it actually going to create maybe more anxiety for some patients having um, a nurse come to them in their home? Um, we were speaking to a patient recently as well who's been having direct patient drug shipments um, and he was saying that he's um, an oncology patient and the first time he, he had that he's used to going to the hospital pharmacy once a month to go and collect his medication. He was not on board or trusting at all that he was going to get that right medication and he made the courier stand and wait while he opened it all up and checked everything and went through it. So there's this kind of as things are shifting, patients aren't necessarily ready to shift with it, even though it feels like a necessity in the world there is today. Um, and the other thing I guess as well is on the other side of things, some people prefer social contact with the site staff and others. Um, one of the home nursing providers that we work with said that during the first wave after about 10 to 12 weeks, as the pandemic started to wane in some countries, they saw a lot of patients wanting to go back to sites and to have that contact with the people that they knew again. Um, but in other patients we speak to, they say that they've really been avoiding hospitals because, you know, with a pre-existing condition, they want to know, like, what's going to happen when they go in the hospital? Are they going to have to press some kind of a button? Are they going to get a fresh mask when they leave? And that really adds to anxiety for them. So I guess the key is in the message there is it's all about flexibility as far as is possible to make sure that you're listening to patients, you're understanding that they, what they want, knowing that there could be some variability. And some of these things might be a necessity because of COVID for now. Um, and a lot of these things will be beneficial for the long term and patients will love it, but maybe not all patients. So keeping as much flexibility in there as possible and really listening, I think, is the key in this case. Thank you, Roz. Irfan, I was going to ask you a, a question to build on Roz's point, but one is coming in from our audience that is, is right in line with where I was headed. When we're thinking about measuring the impact of participation to patients, when we're thinking about measuring experience, what types of measures make sense? What types of measures can we introduce and where is the industry headed right now? Yeah, and I, I love the first two uh, comments because I think they they fall well inside the um, the uh, the the boundary of experience, right? Which is that um, you know if we look at what Bell Labs called innovation, it wasn't innovation until it was fully distributed. It was fully distributed out into the world. It had commercial uh, applications, and it had you know people using the product, and and, and had that feedback loop. And importantly, that last bit of it was the feedback loop that helped things get better. And, uh, and I agree with Anthony, I, I think that tech is great and I think logistics uh, and solutions as Raj was pointing out, but yeah, some people are gonna have a real issue with somebody showing up at their door, whether it's a visiting nurse or, or uh, a, a, an investigational product drop off. And so the way out of the, the unexpected conundrums, maybe the well-intentioned conundrums is gonna be having the feedback loop built into the um, experience uh, as well. And, and frankly, you know, there's a lot out there in terms of 
everything we use every day, whether it's Amazon or, or, or open table, you know, that feedback loop is part of how we do everything else online and how, how, how we engage every other adoption. So I think there's value there. And then I think there's, you know, if we think about the broader themes in our industry these days, uh, you know, democratizing access, you know, enhancing patient voice, there's probably another win there. So, you know, the, the real question the industry will have to ask for itself, I think is, do we want to pull information in from patients and learn from it? Um, or do we want something better? Do we want to pull information in and reflect it back and, and make the whole process you know, very transparent with lots of sunshine that we're asking these questions and we wanna reflect back to you what you're sharing with us so that other patients can see the process, feel more empowered. And I, I think that's gonna be the real kind of next step here as we do all of these other extremely important things. Now, uh, Irfan, there are some initiatives out there. Um, Transcelerate has some work around patient experience measurement. Uh, I know you're doing a lot of work in this area as well. Do you believe that these measures will fit into the way we're thinking about decentralized trials? How do you see us bringing patient experience measurement into this conversation around decentralized? I'll throw it right back to Anthony's, you know, key observation, which is that that uh, it is really important to have great products and really, you know, you know, um, patient centered design right at the core of all of those things. Um, but there's there's just nothing that can top the ability to to learn in those spaces. And, and as we move the trial location from, you know, first from the academic center, then to the private research site, then into outpatient care places, and now finally on the threshold of providing many, if not all of those visits at home in, in some form or another, there's the assumption we're all making, which is very similar to what Roz was pointing out, was that, uh, that yeah, we think it's a great idea to drop the drug off at home until we find out that people don't like that and would rather have a, a pharmacist in, in place. I think we're making an assumption, or at least there's a, a temptation to make the assumption that the visit that's fully decentralized is as good as, as what we already have, which, which for all its inefficiencies is safe, it works, it's got a long track record. If we're gonna innovate in that space, we wanna make sure we're innovating in ways that are, that are um, at, at, at worst equivalent and more convenient, but ideally even equivalent and more efficient. And I think the way we do that too is to, is again, it's that feedback loop that has to happen. And, and to answer a really interesting question for every, um, for every decentralized platform out there is the question that, you know, I think we should all be wondering is, hey, do patients think the visit at home or the visit that's maximally um, decentralized is, uh, is a as good as or superior experience? And I think that if we're open to learning from that, what parts are working, what parts aren't, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for innovation, rapid iteration on things in that space. Thank you, Irfan. Uh, there's a question from the audience about whether these approaches simply support patients in our current participant pool or can expand our pool. And with that in mind, I'd like to actually open our first polling question, because we, as we think about expanding our pool of participants, one of the greatest opportunities that we need to address right now is around participant diversity. And so the question appearing on your screen that already about 50 of you have jumped on is, what impact will virtual trials have on participant diversity? Now, while you're answering this, I do want to answer one other question that's come through on our Q&A. It's a question I'm not going to ask our panelists because I promised them I would not. And it is around some of the jargon that we're using here today. You'll hear me use the term virtual and decentralized. Uh, these are, for purposes of this conversation, they're, they're synonyms. Consider that all of our approaches to enable more flexible location for where patients can participate. Likewise, when you hear us talking about the term hybrid, that's just a subset underneath that category. When we're using the term decentralized or, or remote, it's not necessarily meant to imply everything is in a cloud and remote for the patient or necessarily that it's all hybrid, but it's just an inclusive, an umbrella term for us here. The other demystifying piece I'd like to throw out while you're finishing answering this poll, and thank you to the hundreds who've already replied, is uh, when we're talking about digital trials, that in terms of the hierarchy is a broader category of all of our use of technology, digital and diverse data around our trials considered decentralized to be one of the fabulous use cases that we can enable 
when we're incorporating better and smarter digital in our studies. Okay, James, I think uh, we've got a great response here. So uh, Roz, we have here, what impact will virtual trials have on participant diversity? And we have a pretty heavy positive sentiment that this will either significantly or marginally improve with a small number indicating on the opposite end of the spectrum that this will be a negative impact. Russ, I'm curious for your thoughts on the impact of decentralized trials on diversity and expanding the pool of participants. Uh, so I think it depends is the not terribly specific answer. So it's all again in the study planning and listening to people. So um, we've been talking to physicians and patients and members of the public around the world in recent months to really understand what some of the barriers are to people from certain um, racial and ethnic groups that are maybe underrepresented in research. Also thinking age and um, and other pieces as well, not just um, race and ethnicity, um, but really it's about understanding people's needs and preferences. Um, and so I think if done well, it can absolutely have a positive impact, but it needs to be done thoughtfully. It needs to be in partnership with the hospital staff who understand the communities around them um, and in partnership with patients really understanding what does or doesn't work for them. So we mentioned earlier about not everyone being comfortable having people in the home. Um, I know that in particular, we were talking to some South Asian patients in the UK who were saying that there's often a major degree of secrecy around illness in their community. And so having someone coming to the home would reveal them almost to, to those around them as being sick and that's not something that they want. Um, and so understanding that can make sure that you're being really sensitive in the planning. Um, we also heard from um, an African-American lady that we work with on our patient advisory council in the US um, who's an oncology patient. And she was saying that she knows other oncology patients who they don't go and join a trial or seek treatment because they don't have time. They've got other responsibilities, jobs, family, that kind of thing, and they just can't go and, and go and be in a trial. Um, so by understanding that up front, being able to minimize the financial and the practical barrier can be really, really beneficial. And understanding that specificity that you know not everyone as of, is of higher socioeconomic status that could even afford to go on a bus, for example. And um, so it's thinking about the financial viability um, and really understanding all of those pieces in the planning, um, but also think on the flip side of the things that have gone really well um, that we've heard over the, the pandemic. I think we all need some good news from the pandemic. Um, the feedback we've had from sites is that telehealth has been actually really beneficial. It's something that a lot of them weren't amenable to before, and they were worried about whether they could still make meaningful human connections. And largely they felt they have, um, and that compliance has increased. And often the ability to go to some of those patients that they couldn't before because of reducing those barriers. And it's almost like uh, I've had it described to me as the patient's not having to go to the ivory tower of the hospital, we're going to them. And it's a bit like the olden days of a home visit when the doctor used to come to your house because they can see the patient, they can see their dog, they can see the family and they get a different sense for, for who the person is. Um, so they, they found that compliance has increased as well because things are so much easier. So I think diversity can, and compliance can definitely be improved as long as we're listening to patients and sites to make sure that we are really meeting those needs through the way that we're decentralizing things. Anthony, uh, there are a few who are concerned about the possible negative consequences of decentralized and diverse populations. Presumably, some concerns may lean into uh, marginalizing those who don't have access, access to required technology, access to the bandwidth and the uh, internet speeds that may be required. What are some of the mitigation strategies that you've seen there to address those concerns and make sure we can get the upside and mitigate the down? Oh, we have you on mute, sir. It wouldn't be uh, a Zoom without saying that. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, I was the first one to make the mistake, sorry. Um, I, I think that it, it's not unlike what we do today uh, to kind of mitigate these situations with provision devices and, and, and data plans that are often paid for uh, on, on EPRO studies or studies that are, that are partially virtualized or decentralized. Um, and, and, but, but I also want to go back to one of the comments that Roz made a second ago about what we've learned from COVID. And, I, you know, I think if you look at diversity and, and how 
badly we've performed in this category over the kind of history of, of pharmaceutical research. Um, you know, one issue could be technology and access to technology and how do we make sure that that's fair and equitable and even how can technology encourage more participation by making some things less burdensome and so on. But there's also a really big trust factor associated with uh, participation in these studies and understanding of how the research process works and, and understanding of, of whether it's going to be fair and equitable and so on. There's a long history of mistrust in our industry that I think we've started to grapple with a little bit more in the last few years. And um, to me, COVID provided, a, a, maybe there's another silver lining here that um, so much, um, I think, common interest in clinical research over the last year uh, ha has kind of ushered in a new era if we if we take advantage of it the right way of of people's awareness of these studies and how they work and why they're important and and what needs to happen in order to accelerate uh, some of the solutions that are laying around in pipelines everywhere. And um, certainly what we've seen is that the more educated the general population becomes about how these research trials work, the more you can start to, you know, break into that trust problem, maybe start to solve that trust problem. Not, not with technology, you're not going to solve it by provisioning more phones, um, but this combination of easier access, less burden, the right technology, and a little bit of maybe a chink in the armor of our trust problem, uh, I think all together could, could start to really change the landscape, um, especially after COVID when if we, if we really truly believe in hashtag no going back, um, then I think that part of that movement forward, like you said earlier, Craig, will, will mean that we have to put together the right combination of all these effects. Irfan, how do you see decentralized fitting into a, perhaps a more holistic view, as Anthony is pointing to, around addressing, um, expanding our, our pool and, 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 and engaging with more diverse and representative populations? Yeah, lately I've, I've begun to think of clinical trial access and participation as a pretty good working demonstration of that, that ever-elusive, highly polarizing concept privilege. Um, and it's, it's not typically the model we use when we talk about uh, uh, clinical trials, right? Typically speaking, it's like, well, how do we overcome, you know, a patient's concerns and their objections and their fears about clinical trials? But, you know, we are doing a pretty good job of that in one demographic, right? And, uh, and, and I think when we look across the field, you know, there's that whole stack of barriers that was just laid out by Roz and Anthony really go to, there's a lot that has to happen. There's a lot that has to get fixed. Yes, there's the technical stuff. Yes, there's the legacy conversations that have to happen, but it is promising. I, I think it's it's meaningful when 80% when, when of the, the respondents see it as promising. I think that's right. And then, and I don't think anybody's suggesting that we're just gonna compress the problem into the one, the sort of the one output of technology. But I think, I think that if we look at this as in saying that there are dozens and dozens of elements that prevent that participation, um, and but there are probably five or six, it's probably Ziffian, right? And if you solve for these three or four, you've captured, you know, 60% more opportunity than we ever had before. I, I think that's interesting. I, I think that's really interesting. So I think it's, it's, it's product, it's messaging, and maybe it's location. Maybe where are they encountering this opportunity as well? Are they encountering it in a high trust environment with context and, and support uh, to choose something that they might normally have thought uh, negatively about? Uh, that's interesting. And I, I think that that's what decentralization provides uh, an additional promise of it. it isn't just the convenience factor. It's where could that first conversation happen? Irfan, you mentioned the word privilege. And I think it, it's a word that can make a lot of people uncomfortable, but I really liked how uh, Jane Miles put it in an interview in Applied Clinical Trials this week, framing it around just being privileged to know that trials exist, how to find clinical trials, how to have access to the technology and familiarity with the technology in order to be able to engage, and all of these other uh, attributes, which I think is a very uh, very appropriate way of, of, uh, of framing that. I'd like to shift our conversation now. Um, our title for this morning's uh, time together is around virtual trials and trial virtualization. Anthony, I know you have some uh, interesting opening thoughts for us around this separation. How do you define the two? Well, yeah, I mean, I think you did a great job of um, 
maybe debunking uh, the, the concern about various names for, for this technology. I mean, we're, in the clinical research industry, on the adoption curve, there's this moment where we have to give everything 17 different names and acronyms before, before we actually completely adopt it. So I think that's kind of where we are here on the hype curve. Uh, but whether it's decentral, decentralized, virtual, remote, et cetera, uh, what we've really been trying to focus on is the opportunity to um, take a study and convert some to all of it uh, to be more remote facing. So from the patient perspective, that may mean that they can fill out an ePro form at home on a phone that's provisioned for them. And that type of decentralization, if you will, has been going on in our industry for you know, 15 years or more, and it's very common uh, in all kinds of clinical trials. But now maybe they can add an, an e-consent capability as well. And now there's more and more opportunity to add some video interaction with the site if it's challenging to get to the site visit. Uh, and then you can kind of add and add and add until at some point, um, some or even all in some cases of the data capture or the interaction with that patient is happening remotely. So at, at Medidata, we, we talk about this idea as, as a trial dial and the concept being there's a continuum of fully site-based trials to fully virtual trials. And we want to be able to enable the probability that you could dial that continuum up you know, any way you need to on any type of different study based on geographies and patient population and indication and so on. Um, but, but I think that the other critical thing here, and I'm sure some of the other panelists will have thoughts on this too, is we're starting to see uh, a lot more virtualization, if you will, of, of the technology that's not necessarily patient facing. You know, you mentioned Craig remote monitoring. So getting to the point where CRAs don't have to travel to a site to review source documents, but can do more and more of that remotely, um, even get, uh, you know, do source document review or even full site visits remotely using the same types of technology that we see patients using to, to um, participate in a, in a visit from home. I mean, we can extend this virtualized capability uh, much beyond just the patient-centered devices and, and apps that we are, we're trying to, to make more popular here and into other parts of the clinical operation process. I'd like to uh, open up our second polling question right now. And with this question, uh, we'd like to hear from you. As you're thinking about this concept of trial virtualization, there are a lot of different things this can mean. And I'm curious to hear from you, which may have the greatest impact. We can think about monitoring activities and those that can take place remote versus uh, and uh, versus requiring it on site. We can think about our site study staff and the ability for coordinators to get their work done um, off site, uh, just like all of us are getting work done off site today. We can think about other elements of virtualization as well, perhaps the, uh, the use of synthetic control arms, alternatives for patients being enrolled to participate in a control arm through the use of data, whether electronic health records or historical control arm data from other trials. Um, or are there other areas around trial virtualization that you think we may be missing here that are top on your list? Perhaps you're thinking about digital twins and the ability to create synthetic instances of people using their diverse health data coupled with artificial intelligence to synthesize what a digital version of me may be and how might I perform as a control against me as a, a patient in a trial? Well, we're starting to see uh, the feedback coming in. And here we see a very heavy lean Roz again around remote monitoring. And this is certainly another area that during the pandemic, perhaps one of our silver linings, many ClinOps leaders that I would talk to at midsize, small, large pharma, all seemed to be very excited that this was their moment. They had wanted to enable their organizations to use these approaches for years, but struggled themselves to get adoption. And here it is. So I'm curious, Roz, your sense as you're looking at these uh, different areas that our audience is thinking will have the greatest impact. What's your take on this? Do you agree that remote monitoring may be the, the place to start? I think absolutely, yeah, it's a great place to start. And um, and as you suggested, there's been a real shift in mindset around it over the, pan the course of the pandemic. So 
I think before it was maybe seen as a risk to take on remote monitoring to a degree. And now that's flipped because the greater risk is the fact that sites are closed. We need to still keep an eye on patient safety, data quality, all of those things. So the perception of risk has changed um, and that's really been towards the, being more in favour of remote monitoring. Um, so I think what we've seen is kind of a tiered approach. On, on the one end, we've had that remote site management, excluding SDV, SDR, um, maybe enabling remote site qualification and initiation, but that's been that's been huge, the adoption there, I think maybe up to 70% um, of, of trials have had that in them. But then on the other end, we've had um, remote SDV and SDR, which has been more limited. Not all regulators are amenable to it. Not all sites have um, are able to either give or want to give remote access to EMR to enable that remote monitoring. Um, so adoption of that's been lower, but I think that there's a lot of innovation and to Anthony's point, you know, with, with the technology piece um, enabling things more as we go along, I think there's a, a lot of innovation, a lot of competition potentially coming in that space to really harmonize some of how we do that. Um, central monitoring as well, I think is another consideration too about how we can really use a data-driven approach to focus our monitoring activities to understand any where are there any outliers or any variants that we want to focus on as we're not able to do as many on-site visits with CRAs. Um, we're actually partnering with Locavant on an AI-driven data analytics approach, looking both at historical data from hundreds of trials, as well as the trial itself that you're focusing on to kind of build the risk model and, and highlight any areas that could be challenging along the way. So I think really what we're going to see is a blend longer term. People are more comfortable with remote monitoring. Central monitoring is becoming more popular. Some on-site monitoring is probably still going to be required to a large degree, perhaps with the exception of fully virtual trials. Um, but it's really, I think what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic was the regulators flipping really quickly to allow things like telehealth visits for patients, but they've maybe not moved quite as quickly in some instances around the remote monitoring piece. So I think it, some of it's regulatory acceptance, some of it's how comfortable a, um, a particular client is with a remote based approach. Um, some of it is down to what the sites can do and their technology capabilities. So I think it's going to be a bit of a patchwork quilt um, for a little while, but definitely heading in the right direction. You know, Roz, when I think about adoption in these different areas, I'll often think, is it limited by technology, regulation, or culture? And typically, when I think about decentralized trials around the participant in shifting location, well, I know that it's not an issue, at least in the U.S. and many other countries around regulation or technology, because Anthony and I worked on one of these a dozen years ago, and nobody went to jail. And so the, the, my, my conclusion there is typically it's cultural resistance just around change, and much of that we've broken through in the last year. But it sounds like around some of these monitoring approaches, especially as we're thinking about uh, globalization, we still have a lot of regulatory ambiguity. Perhaps we got some latitude during the pandemic, or perhaps concern that things will swing back a bit. Is that your sense that you're, uh, that you're coming to? Yeah, and potentially. So we we heavily encourage people to think about decentralized trials or virtual trials as a mindset. There is pretty much there's something you can do in pretty much every trial to make it easier for patients and potentially to think about remote monitoring. So rather than thinking why you can't do it or why it's difficult or why the protocol might not enable it, think about how to design your protocol differently. Think about being involved, certainly on the CRO side with ACRO or on the farm side with Transcelerate in working to go and partner with the regulators to help support them in changing their approach. Um, I know certainly through ACRO, we've been working closely with the MHRA where we kind of went to them and said, we don't feel that all the guidance is quite clear. And they said, oh, we thought we were being really clear. I'm so sorry, if you tell us where the gaps are, we'd love to fix it. So we've been partnering with them really closely. So I think sometimes the regulators aren't necessarily all of them sure where to go either. So it's a great opportunity for us to embrace that mindset piece to break down those regulatory, but re regulatory barriers where they exist, but um, really also work together in, in thinking about that risk piece and, and how, how big a risk it really is versus, as you say, whether it's just a cultural, this is how we've always done things approach. You're fun. You have a unique perspective as having been an investigator yourself and now having your organization um, uh, staffing and, and running sites around the uh, around the country. Um, 
Where do you see opportunities for trial virtualization from an investigator side perspective? And is that appealing or does that seem like perhaps even more daunting? I think it's, uh, well, I think it depends on which kinds of investigators are we talking about. I think that, uh, you know, the, the uncontroversial uh, observations about investigators are the pool is very homogenous. It's getting close to retirement in the U.S., um, and there hasn't really been great pipeline development. So it's one of the kind of worst kept secrets in terms of, hey, what are some real existential challenges to the work we all do? Um, one is it would be better if we had an investigator pool that was both younger and more representative of the, uh, the, uh, the patients we want to engage in, in, in all of this. And there is a real opportunity with virtualization of, those, of the way that community is engaged, built, supported, uh, trained, uh, certainly, and maybe even sort of going in reverse order, maybe it's identified, engaged, trained, uh, and supported, um, that I think every one of the, uh, every one of the, uh, the DCT players has a, has a clear role to play in supporting that endeavor, um, because everybody benefits from it. So I, I get excited when I think about it, because I see the right conversations happening. I think that, I can't remember the last time I was in a conversation about uh, improving clinical trials, regardless of the theme in which uh, diversity wasn't raised as, as a sort of a core pillar of how we'll, whatever we're going to do next, we're starting with a blank slate. So let's, let's make sure that we, we, we build this better than the, the way it kind of organically emerged uh, the last time. And, uh, and I do, I think that, uh, that the ability to virtualize the things that traditionally have uh, younger physicians finding uh, clinical trials uh, inaccessible um, become really interesting. I mean, if, if training is suddenly you know, drag and drop. And if, um, if access to putting your hand up doesn't involve, you know, 17 pages of paperwork, you know, sent to somebody you've never seen before, or waiting a year to get on a study after you said that you were interested, then I think you are absolutely drawing from a different pool of, of physician resources uh, that can, you know, that can be gender balanced, multiracial, multiethnic, multilingual, and, um, and really, um, really operating, really providing care in different spaces. So all of that is going to happen through the process. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen through the, the uh, support from the industry. And, and I think the, the I, I like to think that the bleeding edge of that will be the, uh, the way the, the DCT uh, platform companies kind of engage that next, uh, that next wave. And Irfan, when it comes to remote monitoring activities or remote, um, remote work for a site staff, are, are sites ready for that, or uh, does that seem a little easier? Well, I think I think uh, I, I the way we approach this at Circuit is that we think the definition of site is has never been more fluid and more more open to interpretation. So you know, can you if you can put the right technologies together, the right teams together of uh, uh, of um, innovators essentially who want to diversify it and to uh, democratize it then you're going to want all of these tools in place. You're going to want the ability to, uh, to, you know, could you patient recruit via Zoom, essentially, via a virtual experience where the coordinator is, is matched to the kind of uh, patient experience that that particular participant um, would find more meaningful, uh, that somebody coming from a similar context, somebody coming from a similar tradition where they could have a conversation that was much more contextual than the, you know, uh, than me explaining it to them, where, where it may feel like there's nothing in common between us. So I think there's a lot of empathy and, and opportunity here. Um, it isn't, it, you know, I mean, all great technology boils down to solving problems for people. And I, and I think we're at this nexus now where the tools are there, the leaders are there, and the opportunity is all kind of nicely aligning. So I think anything that can pull out the burden from what the perceived lift is for the docs is gonna change what kinds of docs we have. It's also true at the coordinator level, also true at the patient level. So it's pretty exciting. Anthony, Roz set up this, um, this theme that I love that uh, not all trials will be fully decentralized, but all trials can include some decentralized elements. And so as you're thinking about some of the challenges that sites or other stakeholders may have, is technology, where, where is technology most ready to help? Where, where are sort of the entry points for most organizations today? Do people start with monitoring? Is that kind of uh, an easy or a tough use case to go after right now from a technical perspective? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think from a technical perspective, um, 
a lot of these technologies for, for supporting that use case are relatively new and, and born out of COVID. Uh, but there's also a pretty big mind shift to make in the monitoring use case, right? We've got, we, we sort of have a long tradition of patients go to sites for visits and then monitors go to sites to review the source documentation and make sure that the database is correct and enter queries and so on. And we've got to kind of break that culture pillar of the pillars that you, you mentioned earlier, Craig, I think to really get broad adoption there. Uh, but, but on the decentralized patient perspective, you know, sometimes I feel like our industry is not giving itself enough credit for the things that have long been decentralized already. Like, you know, there's a, there's thousands of EPRO studies going on in, in the U S right now. Those are all decentralized trials by our definition on, on this kind of continuum concept that I mentioned earlier. Those are cases where, you know, the patient fills out the data without going to the site and we get real time access to that information. We get real time thoughts from the patient of their experience that day. Uh, there's no site visit. And guess what? There's also very little need to do monitoring of that data because it's e-source. There, there is no paper or alternative record that has to be compared to the clinical database. So, um, and the closer we get to, you know, Im imagine a world where there's more and more e-source data capture coming from patients, and there's more and more ways to kind of hinge together EHR systems with EDC systems and, and, and migrate data rather than entering it twice. Um, those scenarios will all begin to mitigate more and more and more the, the need or, or even the definition of what monitoring means. And monitors can transform themselves into more safety oversight and site management rather than comparing this data value on the paper record to this data value in the, in the clinical trial data system, right? So I, I think there's going to be a, a, a lot more to the adoption curve for, for all these different technologies. But we, we've started, um, the industry ha has started doing this already and maybe needs a little bit more um, a little more credit for that. Anthony, once again, a great uh, demystifying, debunking uh, answer here because there are so many, you're right, that will say, I can't introduce decentralized tools. I can't do e-source in my organization. I can't use e-source and change my monitoring practices. And you just gave one answer that debunked all three. If you've done ePro, ECOA in your studies, you've actually done that and take credit for that in your organization and build up from there rather than looking at these um, new areas as if they're completely radical and unprecedented but actually just an incremental lift from the things you're already doing. Well, we have about 15 minutes left, little under, and we have a ridiculous amount of fabulous questions from this <laughs> audience. So you have absolutely risen up to the challenge. We are going to get to as many as we can here. What I would encourage is, we can also pull some of the follow-up into other types of online and social platforms using LinkedIn using Twitter, follow the people that are on the screen with you right now. And if you are particularly nerdy, um, we do have a clubhouse session we do every Friday on decentralized trials. We have a clubhouse, uh, our DCT, TGIF, thank God it's Friday, Decentralized Trials Edition. And this Friday, what we can do is focus on the unanswered questions from, uh, from today's session and include as many of our panelists or their friends and all of you as well. If you don't have, if you have an Android, I apologize. It's only on iOS, but that I didn't make the app, so don't hate me for it. Um, Let's jump into some of the questions that we have here. And to get us started, I think one of the questions as we think about virtual, and um, Roz, maybe I'll point to you as we're, as we're thinking about this, is around patient compliance. Um, will patient and compliance improve because the participation is easier and right, maybe there's more digital tools that are supporting them, or will patient compliance slip the other direction because they have less guidance, perhaps less personal accountability to a person that they're interacting with. Um, I know I always floss more when I'm about to go see the dentist. Are people more <laughs> compliant when they have that type of accountability? <laughs> um, my, 
It may depend to a degree on how virtual the trial is, I think. Um, as you said, you know, if you're interspersing in-person and virtual visits, um, or maybe just even the telehealth visits, we're actually seeing someone and speaking to someone. Um, I think particularly in phase two, three, I think you'll probably see compliance is good. Um, as certainly as I said, mentioned earlier, from the feedback from sites is actually compliance has been better largely because it's just so much easier for patients. At the same time though, if the technology that's being used is poor, I know I have um, a health app that I utilize. I was talking beforehand, I, have, I got long COVID. So I have a health app that I use to track my medication and my symptoms and things. And the same pop-up comes up all the time. And I see it in the middle of the call and I just flick it off and I don't really pay any attention to it. And I might go a couple of days without being engaged in it. So I think utilizing technology that's positive, that's involves patients in the, the design, uses things like gamification to keep people engaged and interested and not just seeing it as a chore. Um, I think that will be key. So I would say it's a combination of the human element and the technology coming together really beautifully to make sure that we're not just throwing any old thing at a trial and saying, oh, that's a DCT, it's gonna work perfectly because obviously it won't. And Irfan, I would imagine when we're thinking about remote and virtual approaches, it doesn't mean that there shouldn't be an interaction with a study coordinator and investigator. It's just happening in a different way. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I have, you know, I, I'm really interested in the idea of, of looking at what, uh, what uh, you know, virtual or decentralized patient recruitment could look like, especially if it was off the phone and face-to-face -face, uh, virtually, I think is, is interesting. And I think that I think that, uh, you know, I thought the earlier points too about how it's optionality that we're really looking for. Uh, optionality for the sponsor, optionality for the team uh, running the study, optionality for the sites, and, and certainly optionality for the patients first and foremost. Um, because, you know, in the same way that, uh, that uh, we'd like to be able to offer a visit at home, um, you know, people do want to see their doctor. And in the same way, that if anything, that's likelier to be true in a clinical trial because there's more ambiguity, there's more uncertainty, and there's less, uh, uh, less of a relationship uh, there before the uh, study started. So I do, I, I look at all of that as saying that everything we can do to provide the option of having that, uh, that engagement with the doc or the, uh, the, uh, the coordinator um, is great. And it's got to have the flexibility to absorb the patient saying, hey, that's great, thank you. Uh, but I, I think we'll just come in for this one. Anthony, can our platform support that today? I mean, I, I often give this analogy that, you know, when I take my kids to Panera here in the US, uh, at the end of ordering on the app, I get to choose. Do I want it delivered? Do I want it brought to my table? Do I want curbside pickup? Do our platforms for clinical trials support optionality for participation? Oh yeah, more, more, more and more. Uh, and you know, again, it depends on the functionality you're talking about. So, some of it's been supported for a long time, like we talked about ePro. Other things are are at different stages of that curve. But you know, I mean, I, I love I love your real life examples, uh, Craig. And I think I, the dental floss one is 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 perfect, right? Because we all floss more before we go to the dentist, but when the dentist looks in your mouth, they know you're non-compliant um, <laughs> by not having flossed until the day before, right? They know it. So imagine a world where instead you meet with your dentist every week on a video conference from home and you put the video camera right in your mouth and he checks out you know, how, you, how you're flossing. You, you probably change the compliance patterns, uh, maybe from, from the site perspective as well as the the dental patient perspective in that case. So, um, you know, I, I, I know you're kidding, but I think that it is interesting to look at how, how does compliance change if we make it more uh, simple to comply and we make the, the study design, as we talked about all the way back in the beginning, uh, something that's a lot easier to comply with and the decentralized technology platforms just become the enabler of patients doing what they obviously want to try to do, which is be compliant with the protocol and, and help the research study. If I may interject as well, I think sometimes when um, we're certainly talking with sponsors about decentralized trials, they almost hold them to a higher standard than a regular trial. So when we're thinking about compliance, if you've got a month between visits and you're supposed to be completing a daily diary, I'm sure a fair few people the night before are thinking, oh my goodness, and just scribbling any old thing in. Um, at least when you're doing things in, a, in virtual technology, we can see in real time what patients are doing and when they're doing it. So we do have a, a higher level of oversight in a lot of situations that I think people don't always recognize when they think about this approach. 
Irfan, where the changes that we're talking about, um, are they here to stay or are we going to regress back after the pandemic dust has settled? All right, well, I'll start by saying I'm, I'm designing a toothbrush on the basis of Anthony's comments. That's the first point. Innovation is infectious. And the second point will be that um, I think I just, you know, and maybe there's a selection bias in terms of we tend to, to know a lot of people who view the world the same way as we do. Uh, but pretty much across the spectrum, I, I, I don't think I don't think the interest in improving uh, diversity in clinical trials is a fad. I really don't. That that's coming from the C-suite of top 20 pharma. I mean, and it's coming quite sincerely as a, as a recognition. I feel the same way with this because I think the problems are, are linked, and I, I think the same thing about patient voice and patient experience. That doesn't feel like you know 10 years of patient centricity. It feels something very different. Like you know, COVID has, you know, for all its difficulties, created this window to try some experiments. Um, I love the hashtag no going back campaign. And, and I thought it was great that that thing went live and had broad spectrum support, you know, from hundreds and hundreds of different uh, players in the industry. So it feels like we're at consensus here, I think. But I think, honestly, um, for us to not go back would require all of us to, to push patients, doctors, sites, um, uh, vendors, CROs, sponsors, innovators inside every one of those kinds of organizations to say, why would we, you know? So I, I think, I, you know, I'm, I'm a pragmatic optimist. Uh, let's not go back, I guess is what I would say. <laughs> um, just in our final few minutes, Roz, in a minute or less, um, how do we keep ourselves from slipping back? How do we make sure that this does pull forward? Oh, boundless enthusiasm, I say. Um, so I think building it into the operational infrastructure of your organization so that it's not just an add-on and an innovation. This is just the way that we work now. I think it's really important. Partnering closely with sites so that they feel empowered and they feel engaged and they have a positive experience and want to carry on. And I can't see that patients are all going to want to have to travel and things where they haven't had to before. So keeping them engaged as well and, and, and keeping on going with things I mentioned earlier around regulatory and, and interactions with them. And I think it's just this, it's got this amazing momentum and it doesn't make sense to me at all that people would suddenly revert to the old way now that they can see really what's possible. Anthony, you want to take us home on that question? How do we keep things going? How do we keep ourselves from regressing? Yeah, I, I would just echo the previous comments and, and just reiterate that we've been talking in our industry for a really long time about making studies more patient friendly, more patient centric, bringing patients into the design of those studies and, and trying to offer you know, a cohesive technology set of options that actually helps them and makes, makes life simpler for them. So for better, for worse, COVID sort of jumped all that into hyperspeed in terms of adoption and interest around the industry. And I, and I think it's incumbent upon us to take advantage of that opportunity and, and, and keep that momentum going. So I love the hashtag no going back. Um, I love the interest that we're seeing, like Irfan said, around the C-suite and then trickling down all the way to the study teams who really don't want to go back to doing this the old way any more than the patients do. So I think let's um, let's all join hands and uh, <laughs> and uh, promise each other that we're going to push these things forward while while we can. Over the last hour with this panel, we have talked about pulling from virtual and decentralized trials as we think about it today, whether that's hybrid or fully virtual around the participant, and being more expansive as we think about trial virtualization, and how many other elements around the study can be shifted in location, have been shifted in location over the last year, and how much further we can go. We've talked about the challenges around making this the new normal around the organizational commitment that's needed. We talked a little bit about some of the collaborations in this space, like the Decentralized Trials Research Alliance, and I would certainly encourage folks to visit DTRA.org and sign up to stay connected there. Now, you've raised a ton of great questions, and as I mentioned earlier, I encourage you to use Twitter, use LinkedIn, follow the folks that you're seeing on the screen right now. Let's keep answering and keep sharing some of these great topics that were raised. We will bring this up again on, uh, on Friday on Clubhouse if you're there. 
I would like to thank the team from Reuters. I'd like to thank our speakers and their organizations for sharing their time and expertise. Anthony Costello at Metadata, Irfan Khan at Circuit, Roz Round from, uh, from Parkcell, and let's keep this conversation going. Thank you, panelists. Thank you to the audience for your fabulous participation today. Stay well. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks,